functional gene, but also now have clear signs of being inactivated or no longer performing their original function. And the analogy here with this image of uh, if you were walking across a field and came across this entity, you would have no hesitation in ascribing that it once had a, fun a certain function that you can recognize. And you would also notice quite readily because of the absence of the roof, et cetera, that it's no longer performing that original function. Now, there may well be important functions that this entity is performing in terms of environmental or ecological habitat for given organisms, et cetera. But that understanding does not invalidate the argument that this entity is no longer performing its original function. Those things are separable. All right, so what does this look like at the genetic level? There are many, many examples of this type of thing, and I'm going to focus only on one. There are things such as endogenous retroviruses, repeat DNA, um, lines and signs and things like that. Many, many, many different examples. I'm going to focus on the one example that the anti-evolution or anti-common descent movement has the most trouble explaining, and that is this notion of what are called unitary pseudogenes. So these are sequences that are coding sequences, presumably once coding sequences. They've been inactivated due to mutation, and they're not present anywhere else in the genome. They're not a copy. Sometimes we hear about... Um, pseudogenes that are the result of transcription and reinsertion of the transcript and that sort of thing, processed pseudogenes and whatnot. Here we're simply looking at what appear to be functional, once functional DNA sequences that provided a protein that has been inactivated due to mutation and is no longer present in the genome. What's interesting is now that we've been doing comparative genomics and looking at this between different organisms, based on syntony, we now know where to go looking in other organisms, perhaps for the functional version of that gene, if that makes sense. Okay, so some examples. Um, here's the, uh, a paper discussing protein receptors that are important in our olfactory sense. So these are the protein receptors that bind to chemicals that we breathe in that transduce those signals to our nervous system. Approximately 60% of our complement of these types of receptors have been pseudogenized. We contain only a very small fraction relative to other mammals in terms of functional versions of these genes. And we can look at these genes in other mammals and they're in the same relative spatial orientation. So they, the syntony argument checks out, the homology argument checks out, and even the redundancy argument checks out in that they're precisely what we would predict them to be in terms of where they are and the sequence that they have, yet they've been inactivated due to mutation. So just some examples. You won't be able to see this from, from here, but if you're interested, the paper, I think this one's freely accessible. What is even more striking is that we see a pattern where in some cases, these pseudogenes have identical inactivating mutations in various organisms. So for example, here, if you look at one with uh, the 302 deletion up near the top, that's shared between humans, chimps, and uh, gorillas. Same relative location, same sequence, homologous sequence, same codon usage, same inactivating mutation in these three different organisms. That becomes a bit challenging from an anti-descent viewpoint to envision how this, how this pattern could possibly be in that sense. We also see some cases where um, deletion or inactivations are human specific and we see some cases where it's just shared say between humans and chimps but not gorillas and things like that. So there's a variety of patterns that are available. Okay, here's just another example. This is a uh, nuclear receptor. So this is a gene that's respond it's expressed on the nuclear envelope and it's involved in sensing a certain hormone, steroid hormone. And here we have it in humans. So the, its chromosomal location, you can't see the fine lines that indicate where it is on the chromosome. The next bar down shows its relative genotypic context, the, the nearby genes in this little region. And then down below, you can't quite see it, but the points, the little asterisks, indicate where different inactivating mutations are present in this sequence. Now, what's interesting is if you look in mice, that we see this gene is in the same 
genomic context in mice as it is in humans. It's in the same block of syntony. It has the same spatial orientation to the same homologous genes around it. In the case of mice, it's a functional receptor. It has a phenotype when you knock it out, et cetera. So why is it that humans have this sequence in the exact same genomic location relative to mice, and yet we see it inactivated through mutation? That becomes a bit challenging from a non-common descent design view. Here's just making the point a little bit more thoroughly in terms of the identity and homology of what's going on. This is uh, the, to the uh, top sequence is the human sequence of the first little bit of this gene, the ATG on the, the left-hand side indicating the start codon. And just a comparison with the next one down is uh, with chimps. Chimps have the same uh, sequence in the same location relative to the same genes around it, and they share and it's, uh, in terms of this little segment, it's identical in terms of its sequence, including one inactivating mutation that you can see right here, where there's a deletion that's taken place, causing a frame shift mutation, rendering this gene un untranslatable. And yet we see, again, conservation of syntony, homology, redundancy in between these two organisms. And the, the real kicker is, is we know what this gene does. We can look at it in mice. We know what its function is. We can look at it in humans. It's certainly not performing that function anymore. It can't because of its deletion or its uh, mutations that it's accumulated. Even if in the future some function is found for this particular pseudogene or any pseudogene in this category, it still does not, it still does not remove the force of those arguments from an evolutionary common descent point of view. Here's one that I like to use as an example because it, um, it's an issue that speaks to our evolutionary history. And it's an issue that combines the force of the arguments that we've seen with previous pseudogenes and adds a component of um, knowledge of in terms of what this gene does in that it's adapted to a former way of life that we no longer use. So this is a, a gene called uh, vitilogenin that we're talking about. And again, this article is freely available online that you can look at. It's a question of, okay, mammals are presumably descended from egg-laying ancestors. Egg-laying ancestor or, or egg-laying organisms use specific genes to load up yolk content for nutrition for their young. That provides the hypothesis that these genes which do this function we may be able to find the remnants of those genes in our own genome. And based on syntony, we now know where to go digging. We can look where these functional versions of these genes remain in egg-laying animals, such as chickens, for example. We can use that as a predictive. Uh, we know the spatial orientation of what genes are next to it. We can look in the genomic sequences that we now have, and we can sort of do genetic archaeology. We can go digging in that sequence and say, are the remnants of this sequence present? And obviously, I wouldn't be showing you the slide if it didn't pan out. So here's just a phylogeny of mammals. Um, we are what are called eutherians, so we're placental mammals. We use a placenta for nutrition during embryonic development. Um, there are still a few versions of egg-laying mammals that are present. You're probably familiar with the platypus as one example of a monotreme, so an egg-laying mammal. And, uh, and then there are uh, metatherians as well, so the, the different uh, marsupials. And what you find if you go digging genomically, so here now is a uh, scatter plot that looks at the sequence in the region of syntony where this entity is predicted to be. If we're going to find a defunct vitilogenin locus or sequence, we're going to find it in this specific block of syntony. And it's difficult to see, but basically what you've got on the one side um, on the one axis is the human sequence, and on the top axis you've got chicken, which has functional versions. There are three copies, actually, of this particular protein, three, three copies of this locus, this uh, protein. And what you can see quite convincingly, although perhaps you can't see it, you can read the paper, is that the remnant sequences of this gene are present in exactly the position that you would predict them to be based on syntony and common descent. And yet they are hugely inactivated. We're, if we're talking genetic archaeology here, I showed the picture of, uh, of that sort of 
defunct stone building with 